I'm really excited for today. I've been planning a complete gaming and office setup for six months now. I've been squirreling away my pennies, I've sold my Bitcoin, and YouTube has just paid me for my first monetization in February. So today, I'll be upgrading my monitor, my mouse, my microphone, my boom arm, my mouse pad, and building a brand new PC to tie it all together. I'm gonna to be going from my dated old laptop setup to this powerful but minimalist one. If you're thinking of upgrading any of these components, I wanna show you my thought process behind choosing each of these components and linking as many of those talented creators that helped me reach my final decisions. So, let's do it. When planning a setup, I believe we should always start with the monitor and work backwards from there. My setup's gonna be used for gaming and a little bit of video editing, therefore I've chosen what's currently considered one of the two best gaming monitors on the market. I've chosen the OLED King, the Alienware AW3423DWF. It's a 34 inch ultra wide 1440p 165 hertz monitor. Now this monitor shares the same Samsung panel as its predecessor, the AW3423DW, as well as Samsung's new Odyssey OLED G8 but without some of the pitfalls of these other two monitors, which have kind of made me steer away from them. The only other monitor I was considering was LG's 27 inch Ultra Gear OLED gaming monitor, and that's got 240 Hertz. But let's talk about the Alienware AW3423DWF. The DWF has an 1800R curvature. Naturally, it's an HDR product with a display HDR True Blacks 400 certified and rated to a 0.1 response time, which is virtually instantaneously. It has a 165 Hertz refresh rate, which is the fastest ultra wide OLED monitor currently on the market, other than those last two we talked about that have 175 Hertz, but practically it's in indistinguishable between the two. So why have I chosen the DWF over the DW and the G8? There's three main drawbacks that were deal breakers for me. Number one, the DW has audible fan noise that cools the heat sinks at the back of the monitor. Limiting ambient noise will be a huge theme across this video as I do a fair bit of voiceover for my videos. Um, and it can be a real pain in the ass trying to fix that in post. And basically I'm upgrading from my previous laptop system which had incredibly loud fans and that was an absolute nightmare, not only for recording things, but when I'm gaming as well. The second drawback of the other two ultra-wide monitors was firmware upgradability. The early adopters of the DW reported several firmware bugs with standby features, OLED panel care features activating at suboptimal times, as well as the fan curves causing erratic ramp ups of fan speed and noise even when the monitor was on standby. But with the DWF having updatable firmware, Alienware will be able to solve any of these issues or any future firmware issues with a simple update. Now the third reason that persuaded me towards the DWF was the price. The DW and the Samsung Geo LED both sell for around $2,000 in Australia where I am, but the DWF sells for about $300 cheaper. I do want to quickly mention LG's 27 inch Ultra Gear OLED gaming monitor. If I was going for a traditional 16 by 9 aspect ratio, I'd probably definitely go for this monitor. Um, it has 1440p, it's got 244 hertz refresh rate, it's an OLED monitor. It was a very close second on my list, but if I went with that, I would have to go with a dual monitor and I'd have to use my old monitor, so I kind of just decided against that. But anyway, all right, now we've got the monitor sorted. The next step is to focus on maxing out the monitor's FPS potential. For that, we turn to our PC build. With our 1440p 165Hz refresh rate at a 21 by 9 aspect ratio target, I went to a few GPU benchmark tests to see the minimum GPU I could get that would achieve those numbers. I looked at the 7900 XTX, I looked at the RTX 4070 Ti and the RTX 4080. Obviously the 4090 would smash those FPSs out of the park, but at an extra thousand bucks, I didn't want to be wasting our money on our budget on a GPU that would be bottlenecked by our monitor. There was a very strong argument for the 7900 XTX as it, as it natively performs really, really well in Warzone 2. Um, Creative Suite performance seemed very strong as well, but after watching a few different reviews, there tends to be some instability issues um, with AMD, plus I kind of wanted access to DLSS features as well, so I've decided to go Team Green. The RTX 4070 Ti seemed to be quite competitive for the price, and I probably would recommend it if you are going for a traditional 16x9 1440p monitor, but with the ultra-wide monitors asking the GPU to render more pixels due to its 21x9 aspect ratio, 
It means that the 1440p FPS benchmarks that are taken on the 16x9 monitors won't be quite accurate as playing on an ultra wide requires the GPU to use a lot more processing power. And we're kind of looking for the benchmarks that are somewhere closer to the 4K benchmarks, which will be closer at the 1440p for the ultra wide monitors. After taking all of that into consideration, I've finally chosen the RTX 4080 for my build. As I'm kind of predicting, it should be able to hit that 165 FPS cap rate playing Warzone at 21 by nine aspect ratio, probably close to max settings, but we'll see. I might even throw up a benchmark at the end. The 4080 that I've gone with is PNY's RTX 4080 overclocked version. The two main reasons I've got this card is firstly the price. The PNY edition is the cheapest 4080 on the market in my region. And after looking at a comparison video by Spyhood, it appears that there's little to no difference at all in performance and cooling on the budget and mid-level price cards. The PNY was $200 cheaper and the next cheapest option was Gigabyte's Eagle OC version. I think that was about $200 more. Um, secondly, the length. Coming in at 332 centimeters was the shortest version of the card other than the FI edition. So length being a huge factor for me because it opens up so many different micro ATX case builds um, and it might even give me an option to do a little bit of custom water cooling later down the line or something. With the GPU sorted, we can move on to the next piece of hardware to choose and that's the CPU. My goal when choosing a CPU is to spend the least amount of money possible but while still gaining the maximum amount of um, frames that the GPU can render without having it bottleneck. A high-end graphics card paired with an older model or cheaper end, a cheaper end CPU will cause FPS bottlenecking, meaning your, CPA, uh, your CPU can't actually render the amount of frames coming in from your GPU, leaving performance and money on the table. So, uh, but there's a fantastic video that goes further into understanding CPU bottlenecking and I'll just link that down below for you. Originally, I was going to go with the 12600K or maybe the 15 or, or maybe the 5800X3D, but after testing from PC Centric, you can see that at 1440p, the CPU will actually bottleneck the 4080. So, therefore, I've landed on the best price to performance, which is going to be the 13600K. The 13600K has a total of 14 cores, 6 power and 8 efficient cores. Plus, it isn't going to break our budget coming in at about 460 Australian dollars. So for gaming and creator suites, this is also going to be an absolute beast, so we don't have to worry. To cool the CPU, my main criteria is uh, cooling to noise ratio. As mentioned earlier in my last setup, it sounded like I was sitting at the end of an airport runway. So for cooling components, I've chosen the highest rated in the cooling to noise ratio. I've gone with Lian Lee's um, 360mm AIO water cooler. Um, with the 1360K, it shouldn't run too hot, so a 240 or two, um, 280 AIO would be fine. But having the 360 running at lower fan RPMs, it's going to give me a lot better cooler um, a lot better cooling at a low, uh, lower noise level. And you can see this on this graph um, put together by Gaming Nexus. I'll leave a link to his page below as well. For RAM, I've chosen Corsair's Vengeance Pro. Now, this was a bit of an interesting one. I wanted to go for DDR4 because um, at the time of filming this video, it definitely offers the best price to performance. The general consensus from all the reviews that I saw were that modern RAM sticks perform generally relatively similar um, and DDR4 with speeds of uh, 3200 and 3600 give you the best bang for your buck. The, your biggest decision when going for RAM is how much you're going to need. The majority of experts and people making PC videos online are mostly going to recommend 32 gigs of RAM and for a modern system I'm sure this is going to be plenty. Uh, but with DDR4 being so cheap and basically really inexpensive considering the rest of the price of the build, um, I've gone with 64 gigs. So that way I literally never have to think about closing another program or um, closing a game while opening something else and or closing Chrome or anything like that. I just want to have to not think about that at all. And with 64 gigs, it'll be the last of my worries. Storage devices are going to be a very similar story. Um, a budget M.2 drive is going to perform within seconds of a significantly more experience, uh, expensive drive um, and probably won't produce any noticeable performance game gains in gaming. Um, so I've gone with an older generation Samsung stick because I do a little bit of work in, in the TV industry and this is the drives that they use. So I'm just guessing that they're pretty reliable for them and they'll be good for me. Our last decision is going to be the motherboard and case. These two will go hand in hand as their job is to basically house and run our other components. 
For this build, I wanted a small form factor PC so I can fit in the tiny little space I've got between my desk and couch. Now this means it had to be a maximum height of 35 centimeters. An RTX build will run too hot and therefore compromises my noise constraints and a mid or a full tower build is gonna stick out like a sore thumb. So I landed on a micro ATX case. I'll shout out a few of the options that I was considering in my decision that I ruled out but may actually be perfect in future builds or maybe your build. My number one preferred case was the Coolmaster Max 201P. This is a 20 litre ITX case that comes basically half built. You throw in your motherboard, your CPU, your GPU and you're done. It's super easy to build in and it minimizes the hassle of part compatibility. Some limitations of this case is the maximum GPU length is, is 338 millimeters. Not a problem for my PNY RTX 4080, but it only supports 3.5 slot GPUs and mine being a four slot GPU, it's just too small. If I went with the RTX 4070 Ti or maybe an RTX 4080 Founders Edition, this would have been the case I went with. Ultralinks has a beautiful 4080 FI build in this case and I'll link that below. Lian Lee's O11 Air Mini was a case I was so close to going with, but it wasn't actually available in Australia at the time. At the time. Shipping was really, really expensive. Um, but if it was available, I probably would have been building in this case. And two mid-tower considerations that I would have gone with if I was building in something slightly bigger were, um, would be either Lian Lee's 216 or NTXT's H5 Flow. Both have extremely good reviews and would be a perfect mid-tower ATX build. But finally, I landed on ASUS's Prime AP201. It's a stylish 33 litre micro ATX case with tool free side panels and a quasi filter mesh. It supports radiators up to 360mm and graphics cards up to 338mm long and also uses standard ATX PSUs. It doesn't come with any included fans like a lot of cases at this price point, which kind of actually aided in my decision to go water cooled. Um, the AIO cooling fans, they will take care of the top fans. So for the other fans, I bought a pack of three Lian Lee's Uni 120mm fans, so that will actually match the ones that are included in the AIO. Lastly, the motherboard to bring everything together. The motherboard criteria for me was to be compatible with all my chosen parts and also have the ability to overclock the CPU if I decided to down the road. For this reason, I've chosen GeForce's Z690M. But if you weren't interested in overclocking, you could just go with something a little bit cheaper like the B650M range, um, as the 7 series boards just really aren't worth the price jump in my opinion. So that's the PC done, but for me, peripherals are where the real fun starts. They're going to be what's visually on show and what I'm actually going to interact with. I kind of threw the budget out the window for these and bought some really epic things. Starting with my keyboard. Custom keyboards sent me down a huge rabbit hole for almost a year and I loved every single minute of it. I'm not going to go into too much detail now, um, but I just wanted to show you where I started and where I am now on my keyboard journey. My original gaming keyboard was a Logitech Pro. This board had blue clicky switches that absolutely annoyed the fuck out of your mates online. So I put custom linear switches and keycaps on. Now that only wet my whistle for another custom build. So I went on to build a Tofu 65 with linear alpaca switches. This buttery build could probably be described in the keyboard world as clacky. As all custom key guys know, once you've got a clacky board, you need a thocky boy. So I went and made this thocky jockey. The Icky 65 with Gateron ink black switches, lubed and tape modded. Here's a quick sound test for you guys. switch between the two regularly and despite the price tag I have no regrets in building these guys. If you've never used a custom keyboard before I highly 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 recommend you dip your toes in these waters. It's way more fascinating than it sounds. I'm not upgrading my mouse for now. In the past I've gone from a Logitech Geo3 to a Logitech Pro and now I've landed on Logitech Pro Shroud Edition. It's definitely not for everyone but if you're someone who plays claw grip this is going to be one to look into. Down below, I'll post a few mouse reviews from Optimum Tech to help you choose the right mouse for your finger grip type too. Lastly, I needed to upgrade my microphone situation. For my YouTube videos, I've been doing more and more voiceover stuff. Previously, I've been relying on my, uh, my shotgun mic, my Rode Video Mic Pro Plus, or one of my Rode Lavalier mics. The issue with these type of condenser microphones though is they pick up a lot of background noise. 
and especially with my loud laptop, post-production was a nightmare and the sound quality was always subpar. So for microphones, I wanted to basically get the best of the best, but within reason. When you're talking the industry standard, the first place everyone goes is the Shure SM7B. This is what is used in basically every podcast out there. MJ himself even recorded his Thriller album using this microphone. But as always, I wanted to do a deep dive myself to find if there was something a little bit better and potentially cheaper. After months of looking into all sorts of alternatives, I've finally circled back around and gone with the Shure SM7B. I tried hard to find another mic that would sound better or have a lower noise floor, be better value, but in the end, there's a really good reason why everyone uses this mic. And that's because it's just so goddamn good. The downside to the SM7B is you're gonna to need to invest into a DAC, a microphone booster, some X cables and a boom arm just to get everything up and running. So the total setup isn't gonna be cheap. For those on a budget, the best microphone that I could actually find that's comparable in terms of sound quality and at a fraction of the price is the Shure MV7X. Your end product is gonna sound very indistinguishable between the two, but you won't need a booster, you won't need a DAC, it's just USB plug and play. I can highly recommend that as an alternative. So that's it for my setup. And if you have any helpful advice for anyone else upgrading their setup, please comment that down below and I'm sure there'll be some very grateful viewers. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.